Hi, I'm Bruce Horak. I play Lieutenant Hammer on Strange New Worlds, and you are listening to Trek Untold. To Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I am your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. The wave of modern Star Trek shows have caused friction among fans for many reasons, but there's one new iteration of Star Trek that everyone agrees, or nearly everyone agrees, is practically perfect. And that would be Strange New Worlds. Set 10 years prior to Star Trek Discovery, this show is the original voyage of the Enterprise with Captain Pike at the helm instead of Captain Kirk. And simply put, there were no bad episodes of Strange New Worlds Season 1, and I'm confident the trend will continue for many seasons to come. Part of what made it so great was the cast of characters aboard that ship, and that leads us to who today's guest is. Bruce Horak played Hammer on the first season of Strange New Worlds, an Anar, which is a subspecies of the Andorians who have telepathic powers. Most importantly, Horak is the first legally blind actor to be cast as part of the main crew in a Star Trek show, and this chief engineer quickly became a fan favorite, including mine. Beyond Trek, Bruce is an artist extraordinaire. He's a painter, he's a stage performer, and an overall truly fascinating guy with a pretty inspiring life story. This is without a doubt one of my favorite interviews of the year, and I think you're going to love every second of it too. So let's snap to it and get this conversation running at full warp power and learn all about Bruce Horak. But before we begin this week's episode, I want to remind you to follow Trek Untold on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Trek Untold, all one word. You can get show updates, check out some fun memes, and let me know what you think about what's going on with the current events in the Star Trek universe. You can also support this show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash trekuntold, where you can support this show for as little as $2 a month. At higher tiers, you can listen to the shows before they come out, know about my guests well in advance, and even have a chance to ask them questions, get transcripts of these episodes to make sure you get all the info, and more benefits coming soon, including watch parties and live streams. But that's all dependent on more fans like you coming over and letting me know you want to be a part of events like that. If you want some Trek Untold merchandise, check out our store for gear and apparel, including shirts, hats, stickers, water bottles, notebooks, and a whole lot more. New designs will be added throughout the year, so it's always worth taking a peek. Trek Untold also has an Amazon shop where you can peruse everything Star Trek, sci-fi, and geeky on Amazon in one convenient location. If you're looking for a gift for the Trekkie in your life, or maybe want to see some of my favorite non-Star Trek things that you can get for yourself, check out the link for my Amazon shop in the show notes on the audio version and in the description below this video on YouTube. If you're listening to us on iTunes or any other audio platforms that allow for ratings and reviews, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review to help out this show. If you're watching it on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to us at youtube.com at Trek Untold and give the video a thumbs up and a comment. All of these things help more people find this show and to continue growing and bringing you awesome guests each and every week. Now, without further ado, let's beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. And welcome back to Trek Untold. And now joining us on the other side of the screen, he's joining us all the way from the exotic land of Kanada, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, he is everyone's <laughs> favorite Enar. We are joined today by Mr. Bruce Horak. Bruce, how are you today? I'm very well. Thanks, Matthew. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. I'm very excited to talk to you today. Uh, I, I fell in love with Hammer. I think so many Trekkies out there did. Uh, but you've done so many other great things outside of just Star Trek, and I'm very excited to have you share them with my audience today. Thank you. So uh, I'd love to kind of just get down in nitty gritty right away. Uh, and I'd like to ask you the question I ask all my guests first. Uh, <laughs> Bruce, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Were you a fan growing up? Uh, yeah, yeah, I sure was um, a fan growing up and and all the way until uh, probably the day I die. I'm a Trekkie for life. Um, my dad was a, a high school English teacher and a huge science fiction nerd. He actually wrote his master's degree on uh, creating a science fiction class for high school kids. Wow. Um, 
so that's how much he loves sci-fi. And so I'm the youngest of four boys and all of us were instilled with that love. The whole family, we would gather around the TV and watch original series and reruns and do our William Shatner impressions around the house. And uh, uh, yeah, just, just really loved it from the time I was very young. And uh, it was a very special bond between my dad and I, for sure. Um, when he retired from being an uh, English teacher, that's when Next Generation was, uh, I think, maybe in reruns. And so mm-hmm. every day at like five o'clock, it'd be, I'd come, come home from college or whatever, and dad would be on the couch watching his Next Generation. And uh, yeah, just always loved it, always loved it. My, one of my earliest memories of Star Trek, well, I have two. One was, um, also dad was a huge comic collector, comic books. Nice. nice. Oh yeah, he had in his study where he would go to mark papers, quote unquote, after school. It was floor to ceiling comic books and old like comic pages from the 30s and 40s. Those big print pages of, you know, Prince Valiant or Terry and the Pirates and stuff like that. Um, and he also had original series photo novels. I think is what they were called. There were three I know little, those, yeah. Little box set, and there was like the Trouble with Tribbles and uh, City on the Edge of Forever, and I, I can't remember what the third one was probably space seed or something but anyway um i just remember just pouring over those novels and just being it's like it was a storyboard you know little stills from the show yeah beautiful um and i also vaguely remember and this could be a false memory but i do vaguely remember going to see star trek the motion picture in the theater so it would have been like four or five years old maybe getting dragged along to, <laughs> to watch that and falling asleep <laughs> I mean, to be fair, most adults still fall asleep during that movie, huh? but yeah. <laughs> what was that? Was that 80? 1980 that movie came out? or The first one was 79, so right on the cusp. Yeah, so I would have been really little if if that memory is correct, or, or maybe I was just told that's... that's <laughs> oh, that movie was terrible, it was boring, but then Wrath of Khan came out, and like, yeah. I mean, I just, yeah, I followed all the movies, and uh, that's, the, that's the long way around to yes, and... Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so your dad had some like serious nerd cred by the way like that is amazing that he was like that into star trek that he actually had a whole course about it that's amazing oh yeah he had uh the comic books i i, I don't remember who the publisher was of the star trek comics um yeah photo photo novels um you know any movie comics um just right into it he never collected the toys dad was adamant against <laughs> toys he has to draw the line somewhere the art. It was all about the art and the story in these in these pages, not about plastic toys and doodads. <laughs> <laughs> and he would not have liked my collection. Uh, <laughs> so, Bruce, you know, let's kind of follow up on that note here. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about where you were born, who your parents were, what they did, and uh, what little Bruce wanted to be when he grew up. Well, little Bruce was kind of always destined for a career in the arts of some sort. Um, as a, as I mentioned, Dad was a high school English teacher and a comic nerd. He also uh, had a minor in cartooning and drawing, oh. so he was an artist. Um, and uh, Mom also uh, wrote. She wrote like for newspapers and, and magazines. Um, she raised four bo- four boys, so that was pretty impressive on a teacher's salary. I grew up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, nice. and uh, in a little suburb. <laughs> Southwood and uh yeah youngest of four boys and we were all really encouraged from the, the time we were very little to express ourselves in creative ways so there was a piano in the basement that we kind of go down and pound on and we all took music lessons and art classes if we were interested and um yeah I uh I was always drawing and doodling all the way in school so that was a passion of mine was illustrating things I I sort of learned more from drawing the cartoon of whatever event we were to learn about um and I was a bit of a class clown so I I tended to uh there's a George Carlin quote about deprive others of their education um (laughs) I definitely related to that uh getting a laugh out of my classmates was just like the greatest feeling ever um so yeah, that all the way through through school, I, I remember when I was in grade three or grade four, uh, a, a local theater company came to our elementary school and set up in the gymnasium and did this play. And after the play, I just thought, that's what I want to do. I want to write stories. I want to I get on stage and act and I want to 
you know, create that kind of life for myself. So I started writing uh, scripts pretty early on. I think I actually wrote a short film when I was in grade five or six and enlisted some, a friend of mine had like a <laughs> VHS camera, which was oh, wow. like, actually had, and you know, the sound was terrible and all that. And you put the tape in and the battery would last for like four minutes and then you had to recharge. Um, but that we was not an exaggeration little, either. <laughs> no, no. And we, uh, we yeah, made a little short film and, and to edit the movie, we had to get two VHS machines and play <laughs> <laughs> and it just, took, it was like, you know, a minute and a half movie but uh that was kind of my first experience pretty young and uh yeah all the way through school i just wrote and painted and did music and explored all things all things creative and by the time i got out of high school i had to narrow down my um my options so i was i cut out music from one of my options and then eventually i cut out art and the last thing that le- that uh, lasted was drama class Hmm. and uh my grade 12 year I, I actually took an extra semester of drama so that I could just keep my feet in it and I ended up uh directing the second semester uh main stage show which was uh what was it David Campton's The Life and Death of Almost Everybody I think was the <laughs> first show I ever directed um you know it's <laughs> it's such a, I don't know if you know his his writing at all David Campion, Campion, um, very funny Brit. And uh, yeah, I just got the bug for pursuing that career, you know, making a life out of, out of uh, the theatrical. Mm. And this is just my ignorance of your homeland, but my, my only knowledge and reference point of Calgary is basically the Calgary Stampede and yeah. Brett the Hitman Heart. That's about it. That's all I know about Calgary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like those two things would be very far away from your orbit of knowledge and, and area. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, being a Calgarian, like you could not escape the stampede and stampede culture. That's just, mm. it's in everything. I actually ended up um, playing in a marching band. I was a snare drummer in the Calgary, one of the snare drummers in the Calgary Roundup Band. And uh, one of our, you know, big things was the, the stampede parade, which happens, you know, oh. first day of the stampede every year, this massive parade that goes through downtown. And, and the floats and the marching bands and all that. So I, I, I have marched in the Stampede Parade. I, I have that uh, Calgary badge somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, you know, attending um, some Stampede wrestling or at least watching it on television. My dad, again, this all comes back to Carl Horak, but he was a huge wrestling fan. Oh, good, good. <laughs> uh, of wrestling. Uh, yeah. So yeah in the meantime and in between time it's another edition of stampede wrestling yeah that's one for your uh, for your calgary listeners out there <laughs> i got that reference i appreciate that thank you <laughs> you're welcome so uh you know outside of your uh, I, I don't know quite what they call it, but we call it america high school uh, after you're done with high school uh what mm-hmm. performing arts school did you go to or did you go to a performing arts school I did. I took a year off after high school and worked for a theater company in Calgary called Alberta Theater Projects. And I was an apprentice there, basically an intern. And I got to work in every department um, uh, of the theater and just really get to see the behind the scenes of how what goes into actually producing these plays and and maintaining a a company like that, which was amazing. I got um, I got so much experience there. And then while while I was working at that theater company, I met uh, one of my playwriting mentors, a guy named Dan Lipman, and I had a really kind of frank conversation with him about what I should do after my year at Alberta Theatre Projects. And I had been accepted to Concordia University in Montreal to work to go to the playwriting stream there, or um, I'd also been accepted to go to Mount Royal College, which was a two-year, very immersive um, uh, theatre program which fed directly into Shakespeare in the Park in Calgary, so which was a summertime festival of outdoor Shakespeare plays, primarily put on by students from the uh, theater schools in Canada. And uh, having this conversation with Dan, he basically laid out, it's like, you know, you're gonna meet people at Mount, it's a, whatever school you go to, you're gonna start to develop the roots that's gonna become your career. The people that you go to school with, they may go on and they may hire you in 15 years. Or in the city that you're in, you're gonna to start to meet the locals and you're gonna meet the people that are gonna be a part of your career for forever. 
And uh, he said, just what kind of experience do you want? Do you want to be sitting behind a desk writing or do you want to be in an immersive theater program where you're going to be designing lights and building costumes and sets and just getting all of that experience? Initially, I just wanted to be a writer, but by the time I finished my time at Mount Royal College, I realized like I wanted to do it all. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't just about finding one narrow stream and, and staying in that. It's like, no, there's, there's so much more to, uh, to the, the world of theater than just the one craft and one skill. So I got very excited by that at Mount Royal and wrote, produced my own shows for years after that to this day. Well, yeah, let's spend some time talking about some of those shows. Uh, you know, I had a real wonderful time looking up more about you and learning more about the shows you've done in Canada. Uh, and I'd like to start things off by asking about a show that I believe you did at the Fringe Festival called This Is Cancer. And this sounded like a very, I mean, clearly it's a very, very personal show to you. Uh, it sounded very fascinating. And just like hearing about what the show is like, uh, it sounds like a real, real interesting experience. As Spock would say, a really fascinating experience, but uh, no joke. It sounded like a really amazing theatrical experience <laughs> to have. So uh, can you tell my audience a little bit about that show? Yes. So uh, This Is Cancer is... Uh... Yeah, it's a theatrical experience. Um, so in the play, let's call it a play or show, uh, cancer, the living embodiment of the disease cancer, uh, has decided that humanity is in love with him. They run for cancer. They raise money for cancer. You know, pink M&M's campaigns and all this. Is, cancer is everywhere. And so cancer has decided to put on a show for what he believes to be his adoring public. And I play cancer. I'm wearing a head to toe gold lame speed skating outfit, which is very tight and it's stuffed with lumps and bumps all over it. So I have this sort of grotesque body. Um, cancer has uh, two blacked out eyes, like he's been punched in the face and really mm. horrible teeth. Cancer also speaks with a uh, British accent and he's sort of a cross between, uh, what do we used to say? Like Mick Jagger, David Bowie, Eddie Izzard. Um, just like he just he's just really charming and he makes drinks for the audience and he sings a big opening number and there's a rock band with him in my idealized version of the show i've got a three-piece rock band called the inoperables who play with me <laughs> and uh it's this huge sort of rock and roll spectacle where cancer is putting on a show and he's got um a black book and in the black book are all the names of the people that he's ever had a relationship with. And you come to realize over the course of the show that when cancer falls in love with somebody, they get sick and die. Mm. But cancer is immortal. So, and, and he also just falls in love randomly and very quickly. And he goes through all the, the list of famous people in his black book, like Sammy Davis Jr. And he does a little Sammy Davis Jr. number because he loves Sammy so much with the rock band. They, they back him up on a version of Mr. Bojangles. And he tells uh, some cancer stand up about Lance Armstrong, and, um, kind of going on about that. And then eventually he, uh, cancer, uh, so as the audience, I got to back up a bit, but as the audience is coming into the theater, there are all over the walls, there are these sheets of paper that say cancer and there's a line underneath and it says fill in the blank and there's pens everywhere. So the audience can write all over these pages as they're coming into the theater. And um, over the course of the, I don't know, 800 shows that I've done of This Is Cancer, um, inevitably somebody will write something horrible like cancer licks balls or, you know, cancer's an asshole or whatever. So during the show, cancer pulls out one of these pages and he's like, look what I found in the, in the, on the way in here. He's like, this isn't fair. I mean, come on. <laughs> and he sort of tries to defend himself and eventually the audience tell him to go fuck himself. So cancer gets upset and tries to quit. But the stage manager comes on and says, no, you You've signed a contract. You have to do it. You have to do the full show. You're under contract. So cancer comes back all pouty. He's like, mm, you guys hate me. Well, uh, so he brings out his book and he starts going through it, trying to comfort himself with all the people that he's loved. And he finds in the book, he finds the name of my dad, Carl Horak. Hmm. And cancer starts telling the story of how he fell in love with Carl. When Carl was a baby, he fell in love with one of Carl's eyes and Carl lost the eye. And then years later, um, uh, cancer came back into Carl's life and, and, and took him. So cancer ends up telling my story from cancer's point of view. And uh, so about halfway through the show, it kind of flips into a more personal uh, journey. And 
yeah, cancer basically goes through the five stages of grief. He <laughs> goes through anger, bargaining, denial, acceptance, and depression and all that. So uh, by the end of the show, he ends up falling in love with an audience member by accident. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. And oh, well, you can't, you know, this is horrible. You're going to have to come home with cancer. And this is going to be awful. But we decide, listen, we're not going to end the show that way. So cancer gives the audience member a big foam pool noodle. And they're given the opportunity to beat the living crap out of him at the end of the show. <laughs> Very cathartic. <laughs> that is, this is cancer. Yeah. I mean, I love that. It's such a great framing device too. Like, like you know, my, my initial reaction to it was it kind of reminds you of uh, more contemporary times, I guess you could say it's like 700 Sundays with Billy Crystal, but yours is like much more of a performance piece as well and very interactive, which uh, really makes it stand out. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it, I, I do, so at the end of the show, I, I take a short break and then I come back and out of costume and out of character and, and do a, a, not a feedback session, just kind of an informal chat with the audience, anyone who wants to stay afterwards. Um, and honestly, that part of the show has been so rewarding for me as a performer because uh, the impact of it becomes just so apparent and people going through that experience. And sometimes I have audience members who are who are in the midst of their relationship with cancer, their current relationship with cancer. And, and oftentimes I have caregivers who mm. come to see the show and their journey is very, very different. Um, and it's it's different in depending on where i do it I, I i had the chance to do this as cancer in the u.s a couple of times yeah um, i did it at uh, a theater in port in portland oregon and i also performed it at the ars nova theater in new york and um because canada has universal health care the word cancer isn't an immediate uh bankruptcy notice and when I did the show in Portland, this came up in the, in the Q&A and the culture around taking care of one another and knowing that if I'm walking down the street in Canada and I have a heart attack and collapse on the sidewalk, that A, there will be somebody there to help me and B, it's not going to completely bankrupt me and my family and B, you know, not just a, not just a death sentence, but potentially like a, an eviction notice. Yeah. And so even just saying the word cancer, I mean, I get the audience at the beginning, like they shout for cancer and they, they cheer for cancer and things like that. And it's much, <laughs> it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's much lighter in Canada, but it has a different intonation uh, than it did when I was down in the States. So I found that, I found that really interesting. Um, the advancements that have come in cancer research and um, uh, cancer treatments, even since I started doing the show, I think my first performance of it was in 2006. And even since then, We've seen such advancements in it that our relationship to the disease is uh, is evolving and, and is different. And yeah, I I, uh, I look forward to the next time I could do the show. I think it'll be really enlightening. Mm. My family has been hit by cancer in many ways. My mom's had cancer. My dad is still battling his as well. Yeah. Um, and so you know, it's it's definitely interesting to hear that in one side of the world, it's just a completely different take on it. Because yeah, you're right. The way it's looked at here in America, it feels like it's just dramatically different. Uh, for a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, now, for our audience members who aren't super familiar with you yet, Bruce, uh, would you mind kind of telling us about your cancer story? Sure. So I was diagnosed with bilateral retinoblastoma, which is cancer of the eyes on the retina. I was um, just over a year old and it was found in both of my eyes. So my right eye was removed completely because um, there were so many tumors on the retina and they had to remove it right away. Um, and in my left eye, there were just three little tumors on the retina. And what was done, um, I was flown to Toronto and they irradiated, they blasted my eye with radiation and scar tissue developed over most of the retina where the, where the tumors were. But I have a very small window in my retina that I can see through that's unscarred, uh, leave me with about 9% vision or so. Um, a cataract developed in my left eye when I was about four and a half. So I had cataract surgery. And uh, so that has left me, yeah, with a certainly a diminished field of vision, but also diminished acuity as well. So that's been my uh, it's been my normal. I tend to wear uh, contact lens for some correction or uh, very heavy bifocal glasses. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I heard an interview that you did a while back with Daniela Sioni, uh, which is a great interview. Yeah. I recommend folks who want to learn more about Bruce uh, check that one out too. 
Uh, but yeah, like one of the things I found interesting was like you were talking <clears> to her about your eyes and I think your right eye is like an artificial eye, right? Like that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. I know it's a weird yeah. thing to say, Bruce, but that's like, that's some amazing science stuff right there. I'm just like blown away hearing that. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. It's um, I get to wear a work of art with me everywhere I go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the, I mean, not, not to get all gross or whatever, but I get a new, oh, no, please art- get gross, get gross. Get gr- uh, I, I do get a new artificial eye um, every few years. I think, uh, I think the term limit on, on an artificial eye is about seven years or so, maybe, or five years. Uh, so, yeah, I get to I get to have this new work of art, and uh, I have quite a growing eye collection. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have no good segues for that. Someone's going to ask me about something else now, but, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but thank you for sharing that stuff. I mean, yeah, it's really cool to hear all of that. Uh, and we'll definitely get back into some of more of those things as we go on with your art. But uh, I do want to talk about a show you did with uh, certain Star Trek alumni that we've had on this podcast. Uh, and that would be a show you did called Blind Date. And uh, I believe you did that with David Benjamin Tomlinson, who we had on the show. Love talking to him. What a cool guy. Uh, tell us a little about Blind Date and uh, your memories of doing that show. Blind Date, yes. So this is the brainchild of Rebecca Northen. And she plays a French clown named Mimi, who uh, gets stood up on uh, for a blind date. And so she chooses a willing participant from the audience and uh, together they go on a blind date it starts in a cafe and uh, and then it just can go anywhere at that point after the after the cafe closes it's the, the check gets paid and where do you go um and i i worked on that show uh as support basically so um there's a waiter in the cafe and then wherever they leave after that there's a couple of us who work backstage changing up the scenery so if they want to go to a park then we improvise and we put out a park and maybe there's a jogger in the park or maybe there's a cop who comes by and says yeah you you know you're you're the the park's closed you got to go somewhere else or whatever to forward the narrative as it were um and that show toured quite extensively and actually continues to tour to this day um and there have been a number of clowns, <laughs> French clowns, <laughs> who've stepped into the role of Mimi. Um, as uh, initially it was support for Rebecca, and then eventually they were just developing their own clowns. And uh, from the very early stages of doing that show, Rebecca would get asked if she ever chooses a woman from the audience, and she said, "Well, I'm I'm straight. Um, you know, it's cer- certainly up. You know, up for." Uh, for consideration if if we could you know if there was another clown that mm. was interested in doing that and eventually um there's a theater company in, in toronto called buddies and bad times and they put some some work into developing the queer version of blind date which is where david benjamin tomlinson comes into it he played mathieu the french clown yep. and uh, julie orton played mimi but the queer version of mimi and uh we did a run of that at buddies and bad times to develop the queer version of blind date and it was it was just ex- an extraordinary experience um i worked as support on that again playing waiters and police officers and next door neighbors and things like that um yeah it's uh it's just a it's a remarkable show it, it goes it takes kind of the the interview style uh, show into a whole new world where I mean inevitably you end up falling in love with with the person from the audience and uh, yeah it's it's really it's full of heart it's it's unpredictable and uh, yeah a wild night out at the theater Trek Untold will return momentarily Trek Untold is sponsored by Triple Fiction Productions Celebrating 15 years in business in 2023, TFP creates 3D printed Star Trek and sci-fi inspired items that fit into any collection. Whether you're a cosplayer who wants a Starfleet phaser, Bajoran tricorder, or a Klingon dagger, or a toy collector looking for that special accessory or diorama to make your figures truly stand out, Triple Fiction Productions has exactly what you need. And for you figure fanatics, that includes products that are the perfect size for Galoob, Mego, Playmates, and everything in between. All products are 3D printed in the US, with new designs constantly being updated on their website. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, which is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, where the more you order, the more discounts you receive. 
TFP also has a pay what you want section where clearance or misprinted items are available at a discounted price. Best of all, every product can be shipped worldwide. As a special bonus for listeners of this show, Trek Untold has a special discount code just for you. Enter UNTOLD10 at checkout for 10% off of all orders with no minimum purchase required. That's 10% off using UNTOLD10. To see all of their products, head to triple-fictionproductions.net. Or to stay up to date on their newest products, find them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Triple Fiction Productions, where something is only impossible until it happens. Hey, I'm Licia Nav, a.k.a. Ensign Sonia Gomez from Star Trek TNG. And now, Captain Sonia Gomez on Lower Decks with her own ship, the Archimedes. Yay! I finally got a promotion after 25 years. So anyway, I'm here to talk about drivebydogooders.org. It's a little charity I run where we go to the outskirts of Skid Row and from our car windows, we hand out basic human essentials like water, wipes, cold stream cheese, socks, tarps, masks, t-shirts, things to keep people warm. So we just think that everyone deserves clean water, some protein and a way to clean themselves, especially during Corona. We also hand out masks to those who really, really need it, who live in tents on the street, mainly the disabled and elderly who have a really hard time getting to services. And we do all of this with no agenda, just pure giving, no overhead. If you'd like to go to the website and donate, it's 100% tax deductible. And if you click on the donate button, you can go right to the $35 option and pick a signed autograph picture of either the Star Trek The Next Generation or Lower Decks or Total Recall, where I played the three-breasted mutant hooker on Mars, and uh, that's the X-rated version. Put in the comments section your address and anything you'd like me to write, and I'll personally inscribe it and mail it off to you immediately. And again, that's drivebydogooders.org. Ensign, I mean, Captain Sonia Gomez, signing off. Yeah, I really just love all these, like, uh, I, don't, I don't want to keep saying like, interactive performances, but really these explorative performances that you're doing on the theater, because a lot of times when I talk to folks in the show, they're, they're often stage actors, and they'll be doing Shakespeare, which you've done. Uh, they'll mm-hmm. be doing more traditional classical style of theater where you're performing in front of an audience. But everything you're doing mm-hmm. is very much about having a conversation with the audience, having an actual dialogue back and forth with who you're, with who you're basically presenting yourself to. And that's that's a pretty neat kind of way to perform. It's it's really one of my favorites. Um because I, yeah, I think every audience that comes is is different and unique. And um, when certainly when I go and see a show, I like to be invited into that world. And uh, yeah, I just uh, I love it. And and for me, like that was really the development of my painting career was sitting with people and and doing their portraits and having these connections. And I I realized, you know, very early on that spending um an hour and a half or two hours with somebody and, and chatting and getting to know them it's just it's the best <laughs> it's just the best and, and by the way bruce thank you so much for taking care of my my hot garbage segues because you just did this one for me because i wanted to start talking about your art in fact uh so great it's wonderful timing you're so good at that uh oh, <laughs> yeah so yeah i know you've, you've been on this uh painting journey in particular for the last decade or so where what you're doing now is portraits uh so <laughs> i'd love to hear a little bit about uh when you discovered this part of painting that you wanted to explore and uh, what you're doing with it well, so yeah, back in, I mean, I've always, I've always painted and sketched and draw, drawn, drawed. Um, Droodled, well, maybe? I, droodled? I've, I've, have, I've been known to droodle occasionally. Um, we all do when we get older. Yeah. <laughs> I, so it's always kind of been in the background, but it, it never really took a forefront for me until uh, a friend of mine asked me how I see. Hmm. He had he had known me since college. He'd gone to theater school with me, done plays with me. Um, but I I learned to fake being more sighted than I am. I don't think I've ever really mastered being full, looking fully sighted, but more sighted than I actually am. And uh, so my friend Brandon asked me like, how do you how do you see the world? And I decided to paint his portrait to try to capture the way that I see. And um, I just got addicted to this portrait thing. It was very early on, just even sitting and chatting with Brandon and telling him about my eyesight. And I had been very shy about sharing that stuff um, when I was younger. Um, oh yeah, I would shake and I would I would get all nervous about having to talk about how I see and, and those limitations. But with Brandon 
because I was working on this portraiture and because we were, because the subject was just open, it seemed like, oh, all, all questions are on the table and all subjects are on the table and, and are welcome here. Um, yeah, it broke down uh, the act of painting into like really manageable things for me. It was having a conversation with somebody, which I can do naturally. It yeah. was uh, just putting some paint on a canvas and don't worry about getting it right. Just try to paint what you see. And that seemed manageable to me. It didn't seem like this unachievable, unattainable goal. It's like, no, just be present. Talk to Brandon, paint what you see. And a year later, I had done 365 portraits and I just couldn't stop. <laughs> and um, it eventually turned into doing landscape work. And I just, I found myself, um, whenever I was faced with a moment of boredom or uh, anxiety or whatever, I could, I could turn that part of my brain off and just paint what I saw and be present. Um, uh, eventually that portrait series turned into another theatrical endeavor. <laughs> <Of> course, <laughs> when doesn't it? As all, as, as all uh, spokes seem to lead on the same wheel to more theater. But um, yeah, I now do a show called Assassinating Thompson, where I paint a portrait of the entire audience, <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, I'm, it's, I'm just actually about to take it on tour. I leave on uh, Wednesday to go to Manitoba and do 25 25 performances in 36 days uh, all over Manitoba and Northern Ontario with Assassinating Thompson. And I will be painting one large portrait every night of whoever comes to see the show. And while I paint, I tell the story of how I lost my eyesight, how I became a painter. I tell the story of sitting with Brandon. Uh, I talk a little bit about my dad. And uh, I also solve the mystery of who killed Tom Thompson, who was a Canadian artist who disappeared Myster under mysterious circumstances in 1917 paddled off in a very Canadian true Canadian fashion <laughs> he got in a canoe and paddled off across a lake and disappeared and a week later they found his body and there's this ongoing Canadian mystery of who killed him or how he died or you know the various theories so I solve it finally we can put it to rest uh in the show assassinating Thompson and uh yeah I, I get to marry like my favorite things I get to story tell and paint and sit and be present with people and chat and uh you know connect with an audience um yeah it's it's a real joy and then at the end of the show uh i turn the painting around and then i sell it to the highest bidder in the audience which is a whole other trip because <laughs> i get to i get to be an auctioneer and then uh and yeah then we pack up and go to the next town i'm this on this particular uh tour i'm donating all the proceeds from the sale of the paintings to um an organization called canadian guide dogs for the blind which uh provides training and animals for um, for people with uh, guide, who need guide dogs and uh yeah that's what i'm doing for the next month and a half <laughs> in in the uh, hopefully not too freezing cold of northern ontario <laughs> it just well, sounds cool to say it doesn't it I mean, to me, all of Canada is just like a frozen wasteland, but I don't know better. So uh, one of these days I'll get up there and correct that. But, uh, you know, something I want to kind of dive into a little bit more is, um, you know, it reminds me of a story I heard about, I believe it was Monet and how, you know, especially as he got older, his visibility, uh, his vision got worse and stuff. Yeah. And like, you know, towards the end, he basically has an assistance painting for him, but he'd have to basically do it within a certain time period because the sun will be going down. It'd be harder for him to see. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would also affect, you know, how the painting would look because a big part of that painting is trying to get consistent time of day if you're doing an outdoor shot like he was quite often um so you know in your case we talked about how you have like this nine percent vision right so mm -hmm. um what do you see how do you see I mean, i'd love to hear what that actually looks like if you can describe that for us yeah so the way i uh i describe it in the show is i have the audience put their hand over their right eye cover that up because mine's artificial and with their left hand you make a little tube a tiny little straw pinch it off and then look down through that. So that restricts your field of vision to about 9%. And then as you're looking down that straw, imagine looking through murky water, like an old lava lamp where things are mm. floating in the field of vision, because I have a lot of floaters, uh, detritus in my vitreous, and uh, which, which really sounds technical, doesn't it? I'm, I'm doing Star Trek jargon now. Detritus. That's a techno battle. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, best way to describe it also i have extreme light sensitivity so going from a 
bright spot into a dark spot it basically just becomes a wash mm. for me actually um now as a result of this extreme tunnel vision i'm constantly scanning in order to figure out where things are and as much as i can see when i'm moving up a sidewalk at least before i got my white king which <laughs> saved my life on a number of occasions but um generally it was like shoulders up and head down and just sort of focus on the spot that's ahead of me as i'm moving but um that's changing now that i've got a white cane the cane actually does that all for me acts as my peripheral vision it, what's interesting to me is you know like typically when we talk about painting and art in general it's like the observation of life and that is the key word in art and impressionist art and realist art especially it's the observation of life but uh, mm -hmm. for someone like yourself who has more limited ability to do that uh, it, it's real fascinating just to understand the way you're looking at things and um i guess if you don't mind i'd kind of like to maybe get a little more description of how you see art around you let's say because i'd love to hear like what you see if you look at like Starry Night by Picasso, or if you look at uh, a Rembrandt painting, more traditional, you know, Rembrandt style painting, or even like something more abstract, like a Mondrian, like how do you ingest artwork? Great question. Um, well, first thing is that because of all the, um, the, the damage I've had done to my eye, I see like a aura around everything. It's part of the refraction of light. So the first thing that I, and if I'm sitting and doing a portrait, for instance, and I'm looking at your face, I will see this aura of light. And so I will start a painting with that color or that sort of broken up texture. And then I have to look in small, small increments. And so the work that I'm creating doesn't necessarily take a big step back. It doesn't have like one uniform shape to it. It looks like almost pixelated art that's been slightly augmented in the same way that if I'm looking at... Um, you know like a more classical work uh that i'm going to be ingesting it in very small segments um mm. when i take a big step back everything just kind of becomes hot mush is how i describe it mm. <laughs> it's all blurry and, and broken up i have to get quite close and i have to look at it in smaller segments um it's very impressionistic i love um monet especially for the later work because it's, i understand it he he had maybe glaucoma or a cataract going yeah. so there's almost like refractions of light and that's very much how i see um there was an insulation of, of uh, the water lilies that i saw a number of years ago one of some of his larger work that he used to lay out on, like, on his studio floor the big big paintings um and as soon as i saw that i'm like oh that's how i see <laughs> that kind of that that notion i also really love uh pointillism for that same reason mm, yeah surat that work i just i love it because it um it captures certainly uh, an element of how i see i've done over well i'm getting close now to 700 portraits and i feel like there isn't one individual portrait that i look at and go that got it that's everything in there but when I install the work, I often do two or 300 of my eight by tens in one large grid. And when I put those all together and take a big step back, that's when I get the sensation of that's it. <laughs> they, they all have to be there. They all have to be in, in a certain order and a certain kind of uh, uh, arrangement on the wall. And I, I get to take a, a step back and that's when I get the feeling of maybe capturing it but there has to be some audio in there as well because i'm a very uh audio audio learner mm, whatever that sense is auditory learner <laughs> that sounds like a word yeah i'll go with that one <laughs> sure yeah it's curious to hear if i if i can kind of paraphrase your style a little bit it's kind of like you're starting with the negative space and then oh, yeah. kind of layering within it which is like that's such a unique way to create art and I, i've uh, i've done stuff like that before and it's difficult because ne kind of interpreting negative space is is a challenge i think Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's because it really is. It's everything that's around you. It's not the subject itself. So you're basically building with what's around the person and then working inwards. And uh, as part of your process, I believe, right, you're doing the interviews, right? So how much of the interview then informs you of what this person looks like? Is that a part of your artwork as well? Definitely. Um, and certain, I, I mean, I from very early stages, I would I would actually record my portrait sittings and and oftentimes go back and listen to the audio as I'm working on the piece. Um, yeah, I, I think, and this was this was one of the the things I was um, when I was researching Tom Thompson and his work and some of his approaches. He said that color can affect your emotion, and if you can kind of put yourself in an emotional space, there will be a color that seems most obvious to that. Hmm. You know, often 
I mean, very broadly say, oh yeah, red is anger. I mean, that's very broad, but um, there's a sensation certainly as I'm working in color that um, I get, I start to feel that bit. And oftentimes listening to, uh, to an interview, I'll go back to that feeling again. And then the color will, will seem most obvious from, from that feeling. Um, yeah. Audio is a huge way, a huge way for me to be transported. Um, I have a, an actual audio clip of my dad that when I hear it is, I, I feel his presence more. There's that haunted sensation of listening to his voice that I just simply don't get when I look at the photograph. Um, photograph evokes other things, but for me, the audio is just like, oh, he's in the room with me. He had such mm. a, as soon as I hear the voice, it's like, oh yeah, that, that's what that guy was like. Um, I can't necessarily uh, create a photorealistic impression of my dad in my mind from hearing the audio, but there's memories, there's places, there's smells, there's emotions that I just go with. And so for me, um, now, as I, as I do my, my portrait installations, I accompany them with audio clips of the people describing themselves. Um, a question I will often ask my subjects as I'm doing their portraits is, how do you describe yourself to someone who can't see? Mm. And I, I really, um, I love that question. The, the pause after it gets asked. <laughs> The question that then gets asked as a result of the question, which is usually, um, do you mean physically or in some other way? Uh, that's generally the first question. And, uh, and then just where it goes from there, everyone's description of themselves, how they see themselves, um, how they want to be perceived, what they leave in, what they leave out, um, the lightness or the heaviness in the voice as they're considering it and responding to it. Um, and then just what that question prompts um, in terms of the, the conversation that follows it, I think is just, uh, it's intriguing to me. Um, and I've had some, you know, beautifully poetic responses to how to describe yourself to someone who can't see, to just like the most mundane, like, oh, I'm, you know, 5'10", I'm a, I'm a dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. I mean, that's, that's something now, now I'm afraid to even do the portrait myself, but uh... <laughs> Yeah, and for anybody who's actually curious about doing this, uh, they can actually visit brucehorak.com. They could sign up to get one of these done. There's, I think, three different ways to do it, right, Bruce? That's there what somebody did say. Yeah. Shameless plug, Bruce, go for it. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm now sitting over Zoom. So I've been uh, doing portraits of people from all over the world, which is fantastic. Um, there are three different levels, yeah. So there's um, kind of the basic portrait set sitting, which is, I believe, 30 minutes. And it, there's no audio recording. It's just a 30 minute chat. We hang out. I'll take some screenshots and then I do a digital portrait that gets sent to you. Like a, uh, so you get to keep that. Or there's, um, let me think now, that there's an hour long sitting, which is includes um, a, a chat. We hang out. I do some sketches. And then you receive an audio uh, section from the sitting plus a digital uh, PDF. And uh, like a time-lapse movie of the portrait being created. And then the third tier is all of that, plus an eight by 10 canvas, hand-painted acrylic on canvas portrait that gets mailed to you. Wow. Um, yeah, and it's uh, it's keeping me very busy and I'm getting to meet people from all over the world. And uh, yeah, I uh, I just love it. I'm, Star Trek has certainly opened up that world. Um, people learning about me and my work and, uh, and just getting to chat with people about Star Trek is kind of the best ever. <laughs> I don't disagree about that at all. And yeah, folks, definitely check it out. Go to brucehorak.com if you want to learn more about that, how to sign up for it. Uh, I believe it starts at $100. It works its way up through the different tiers and it's worth every penny. I mean, honestly, and that's the thing why I love talking to artists on the show, especially is because I feel like a lot of my audience might not be as exposed to this part of the arts and they don't understand the value of art. So you know, getting a hundred dollar thing, getting to spend time with Bruce Horak. I mean, that's worth more than a hundred bucks, folks. So, I mean, go for it. You're going to have a piece of real unique art you're going to love forever. Mm. Um, now, Bruce, you know, one, one last thing here about the artwork too I want to talk about is, you know, as we mentioned throughout this, you are a cancer survivor. Uh, your father, though, passed away from his esophageal cancer. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a heavy burden to have to shoulder as a survivor because it's, you know, watching a parent die from cancer, a thing that you've been battling through yourself. I mean, so... Just looking at all the work you've done, because so much of it is very personal and it's very intrinsic because of literally the way you see the world. So, you know, having your father pass away from cancer, I mean, how did that affect not just your artwork, 
but the way you thought about your life and saw it through art. Wow. Um, losing my dad, this is coming up on 20 years, uh, this August. Um, I mean, everything, everything changed at that point. Um, he actually passed away on my birthday, my 29th birthday. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, what are the odds, right? Like one in 365, <laughs> but, uh, he had an incredible sense of humor in the last year of his life. He just imparted so much wisdom that I have taken not only into my life, but into my, my art as well. And in my relationships, one of the things he said to me in that last year was, um, perhaps we can get to a point where we no longer grieve what is lost, but we celebrate what remains. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, um, you know, what I think within the context, he was actually showing me the arrangements he'd made for his own funeral. Imagine that uh, he wrote his own obituary. He made all the arrangements for his own funeral in the last year of his life. He and my mom spent hours in the study as he was packing up comic books and shipping them off because he sold off his whole collection and left that all the, the the money to my mom to take care of her and he spent that whole last year just basically going through his life and and reconciling with it and he said i i don't want you to to be thinking about you know what we've lost here but celebrate each other like enjoy each other like take care of each other celebrate what you have and celebrate the good times that you've that you've lived through um and that was hard for sure like losing him on my birthday i just thought like wow oh, this sucks like my birthday is ruined for the rest of my life but it has become a marking of transition you know it's another year that i've i've, I've gone through it's another year without him but it's also another year that um my relationship with him has deepened has, has changed um, he appears in all of my shows, pretty much. I mean, I talk about him in Assassinating Thompson. I talk about him in This Is Cancer. Um, I'll, I'll talk about him on every podcast, probably. And certainly within my art, uh, a big inspiration for me painting and trying to capture how I see was wanting to paint a portion of my dad. Uh, when he was diagnosed, I, I thought a lot about like celebrating what I have. What do I have? I have 9% vision. Instead of grieving 91% that I don't have and trying to hide it, it's like, no, I want to celebrate this. And when I was diagnosed, it was my dad who stepped in and said, you got to find some way to save some of his eyesight. They were going to remove both my eyes. And he's like, there's got to be a way. They did all this research and they found this doctor in Toronto and blasted my eye with radiation and 9% remained because my dad kind of stepped in. Um, so I started painting and I wanted to paint his portrait to show him what he had given me. Um, and to this day, I, I keep working on the portraiture because it's a celebration of what I have. Um, and to share it is a, is a, is a pretty rare gift. And uh, it has, you know, it, it certainly started out <laughs> as a bit of a selfish act of, I want to figure this out. And how do I see? And there's elements where I'm, I'm still learning a lot about how I see the world and how I move through the world. But um, the, unintended consequence of that has been the inspiration there are people with disabilities people with visual impairments who have seen my show have tried painting have tried writing have tried performing have gotten on stage for the first time um and have gotten back to me and said yeah i wouldn't have done that had i not seen you do it and mm -hmm. i'm like whoa <laughs> i mean that's the greatest uh accomplishment that i can i can think of bar none um to to, rec to to actually get to witness and be a part of somebody else's creative journey in a positive way. Um, that's, that's the best. And I've been so fortunate that, um, that Star Trek really has opened up that door on a global scale. I was, I was performing for 10 and 15 people in, in uh, beer tents across Canada. And then suddenly <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm afforded a much larger community as a result of that. And I've been hearing from people all over the world of uh, all shapes and sizes. And um, yeah, I, I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, some people take their grief and just kind of hide away with it. Other people build shrines with it. And that's what you've done. And you've really been able to share those gifts, like you're saying, and uh, kind of just spread the message of your dad and keep him alive and keep him in the heart of other people. Don't even know that they're probably in their hearts now. Yeah. So that's very admirable. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hey everyone, Matthew from Trek Untold here, and I want to tell you about a big Star Trek event happening in May in New York City. Trek Long Island is kicking off in Hopog, Long Island for the weekend of May 20th and 21st. This is a show for fans, made by fans. They've got celebrities, scientists, podcasters, and so much more jam-packed in two days of out-of-this-world fun. Trek Long Island has a phenomenal guest list, including some rare gems that scarcely do public appearances. They have guests from Star Trek Discovery, like the amazing Doug Jones, Oded Fair, and David Ajala. Star Trek Picard's Avon Evagora and Issa Briones, Strange New World's Bruce Horak, and many more from modern Trek shows. But don't worry, they've also got guests from the original series movies and episodes, such as Robin Curtis and Barbara Luna, as well as J.G. Hertzler from DS9. Plus, a host of behind-the-scenes contributors will be appearing virtually, including Michael Westmore, Doug Drexler, The Okudas, and an in-person appearance by composer and sound designer Alan Howarth. There's going to be panels with Star Trek authors and historians, scientists breaking down the science of Star Trek, visual effects artists explaining how the magic gets made, and so much more in addition to panels from fans like you. Trek Long Island has something for everyone, and that includes all ages, as there will be children's entertainment and activities, and evening cabarets and late night comedy for the adults. This event is going to be two Trek-filled days you do not want to miss. So prepare your away team for May 20th and May 21st for New York's best new fan-run Trek convention, Trek Long Island. Check out treklongisland.com for more details on how to pick up tickets and attend. Trek Long Island, boldly going and going kindly. All right, so Bruce, let's beam into our Star Trek discussion now. You were Lieutenant Hammer in the first season of Strange New Worlds, the chief engineer of the Enterprise. So. Yes, sir. What can you tell me about the audition process? And I'm wondering if two things here, if you are auditioning specifically for this character or for someone else, uh, and if you know for Hemmer, if they were auditioning exclusively for visually impaired actors, or was it open to folks without disabilities? Well, the, when the casting call went out, it was specifically for performers with uh, visual impairments, or, or they were given preference anyway. That's what they were looking for. And it was specifically for the character of Hemmer. Um, it was during all the lockdown, so I did everything over Zoom in my kitchen. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty extensive process. I did, I did, I think, maybe three or four different sessions. And it was to read the, uh, or to, to do the scene with um, where Hammer meets Uhura for the first time and Spock is there. And yeah, it was, uh, I, I leapt at the chance right away just because it was a new Star Trek and I just, got super excited about that they didn't I don't think that Uhura's name was even in the script so I didn't know that this was the, the character but it was definitely Hammer in there and Spock so yeah it got uh it definitely got very excited about that and, and reading it that but that I was an Enar I went and looked at the, the episodes of Enterprise that the Enar show up in just to see uh if I can get some tips <laughs> from what the other actors had done yeah, I should add to it. I said uh, disability, so apologies for that. But visually impaired actors, um, you oh, know, yeah. you are the first legally blind actor to be cast and part of the main crew of a Star Trek show. I mean, I don't know my my uh, knowledge of the franchise. It feels a little low here, but like, uh, do you know if there were any other folks who were visually impaired that appeared in Star Trek? Or are you like just one of the first? Period. Don't know if there was anyone else. Um, to be honest, yeah, I don't. I don't know if they, if there were other actors with uh with disabilities they i don't think they've ever been on the the main crew hmm. all right so let's talk about now you got the gig you booked the role you are now hammer but you got to now go through the makeup process so talk to me about how arduous that was i, I can the smile on your face says a lot right there <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i i really had no idea what this character was even going to look like until the the first day of uh I think it was the camera test. The day that we did the camera test was when I when they put all the makeup and all the prosthetics on me, and that took five and a half hours. And uh, there was two two technicians, uh, Chris Bridgers and Shane Zander, were the, the two artists who put the, the piece together, and and it was all based on the design that had come. Uh, sort of, I guess it was created somewhere in California. Um, yeah, it was it was extensive. It was a long time to be in that chair, but um, they eventually got the whole process down to about three and a half hours. 
so uh that was a lot easier but uh, yeah it was fun actually because they were uh, uh, chris bridges is kind of the head of the prosthetics department on um, on strange new worlds and eventually kind of pass it off to uh, alan cook and shane would work on it um and yeah we just had a blast they were really funny guys and yeah we just had a good time listening to music and talking about music and nerding out about the movie industry and uh yeah they got me hooked on god what was that movie they got me to watch the thing oh wow oh my god Ugh. have you ever seen that movie it's terrifying it's the john terrifying. carpenter thing yeah 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 oh yeah, yeah. that's nightmare well, fuel as uh as uh, prosthetics devotees they're like this is the tops you got to watch this and it's terrifying <laughs> it's really good so yeah. yeah that was that was kind of the process was just kind of you know, sit in a sit in a chair and have people glue stuff on your face. I kind of looked at it like going to a spa. Mm. That's one way to look at it. I mean, for for you, it's a spa. For others, it's just the worst thing in the world. But uh, I am kind of curious. You know, since you are uh, an A and R, you have the antenna. I mm. mean, uh, were, were there were there different sets of antenna for different purposes, or was it always just kind of like one set of antenna glued to your face? Oh no, it was it was one set. Um, and and I think they had, they for the most part they reused the antenna in the prosthetics pieces, but everything else uh, at the end of the day just kind of got stripped off and thrown away because it was, you know, I was in there for you know twelve hours sweating, and so it was kind of slowly slowly breaking down the prosthetic stuff. But the antenna eventually got uh, got used more often. But yeah, it was just pretty solid piece <laughs> on the top of my head. So when did the character of Hammer click for you? I mean, was it kind of like an immediate thing that you felt this bond to the character or did it have to grow to a certain point and then you realized like, oh, I get this now? I really connected with it from the first reading, actually, with that very first scene. Um, there were a few lines in that scene that ended up kind of on the cutting room floor, but Hammer um, in that scene kind of, you know, takes a bite out of Uhura a little bit and... and bucks up against the word um uh what does she call it people who are with a i can't remember the word she uses in the scene but anyway he sort of goes off on a rant about essentially just using your perception in a different way um which i get a lot of people asking oh you must have super hearing it's like no i don't have super hearing it's, it's just that i tend to pay attention to it and so somebody enters a room i can tell by the not always but sometimes by the way that they walk or the you know the way they, they move down a hallway as you listen to it i go oh I, I know exactly how my mom would walk or my dad's gait coming down the hallway i can tell the difference between my, my brothers and things like that with their intonations of their voices outside yeah. of a hallway and so you pay attention to the stuff in a different way and that's kind of what what hammer expressed in that scene is just recognizing the change in temperature or the, the direction of the wind or whatever and I, I absolutely just connected to that and so I put a little bit of that in my pocket and as I read the scenes it just it seemed like Hammer would say a lot of things that uh, that very easily came out of my own mouth so hmm. it was it was a pretty easy character to connect with I, I think it, the the kind of high status uh, grumpiness is a little bit um, that's more of the acting that's not so much me <laughs> And I was wondering, like, if there was any real life inspiration for who Hammer was, but it sounds like it was just very much like an extension of who Bruce Horak is. Well, it's an extension, uh, minus the grump, to some degree. But, but the uh, yeah, there is. I, I know a few. Um, uh, should we say without using names? I know a few <laughs> hyper intelligent individuals who uh, who inspired the character of Hammer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, Hammer like became a fan favorite too, like right away, and that includes myself here. And yeah, you know, I'm curious to know if what you thought of this feedback that you got from the fans, this reaction for this character, and uh, why you think Hammer connected with so many people. What do I think of it? I think it's amazing. Uh, I, I couldn't be happier to be to be a character who's on the fan favorite list because uh yeah to be to be one of those characters like sorry or you know happy to see you go that that would suck um yeah it's pretty great and and really since the start of uh since the, it was first announced on star trek day and whatever that was 2021 22 yeah um i don't even know what year it is anymore ages ago <laughs> Uh, it feels like it, but yeah, from the very first moment, it's just been an incredibly welcome, welcoming uh, family, um, and that's something that's just been kind of ringing true, ringing all the way from the beginning. This is people welcoming to that world, to the family of it, and it's very, very, 
yeah, it's really nice. Um, what was the second part of the question? Uh, why uh, Why did you think that Hammer connected with so many people? Why did he connect so well? Well, I guess um, I guess his confidence, his self assurance. Um, there's a bit of bit of humor. Um, yeah, and there's just something about the mentor figure. I think people really. I mean, I've always I've always um, kind of latched on to the mentor figures in movies. Obi Wan's one of my favorites. So <laughs> be having having Uhura's mentor be kind of cool and a little bit aloof and then slowly warming up over the course of the series seemed like a recipe for success i mean for me it kind of felt like there was elements of odo if you're familiar with deep space nine there was kind mm-hmm. of like that was elements of the outsider but also you know since this is strange new worlds this is star trek many many years after the original series first aired when spock was that alien character this time mm-hmm. you're kind of like that foreign element also where we don't quite know what to expect who you are but also the nice like warmth of Odo. It, it is a lot of interesting stuff there in that character. There's so much to like dissect, but uh, for me, that's definitely yeah. the stuff that made me enjoy him so much on screen. Yeah, he's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little biased, but yeah, no, totally. I'm is. a little biased. I am a little biased. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at its core, Strange New Worlds is an ensemble show, though, and you've got a great cast to work with. I'd love to hear a little bit about some of the different folks you got to perform with, uh, starting with the captain, which would be Anson Mount. Uh, to me, it seems like that man just exudes Starfleet captain energy 24-7. 100%. 100%. Um, yeah, my my first day wasn't my first day on set. I think my first day on set was actually in... Um, shooting in uh sick bay but when i when i had my scene on the bridge and that was when i first met anson yeah he's an incredibly warm person and very welcoming um we shot the that first season in pretty serious lockdown conditions though so i will say this that my interaction with the rest of the cast was pretty limited as we were all you know in the hallways sit, sitting six feet apart wearing mm. you know our face shields and things like that really not yeah. just not encouraged to hang out and we would have our, our lunches kind of in our trailers on, on our own so i really didn't have much interaction i'd say the cast members that i had the most uh interaction with would be uh celia and um oddly enough ethan because he would often be in the uh in the prosthetic chair getting his ears taken off or put back on again so those were the two that i really uh, actually connected with the most over the course of the over this series anson um yeah he my fondest memory of anson actually is uh during the shooting of what was the episode now i think it was um Oh, the one where I'm the wizard. I can't remember the title now. No, oh, the Elysian no. Kingdom. Elysian Kingdom, thank you. Uh, I just remember uh, coming back from lunch and there was just this music just blaring coming from the other side of the of the uh, the warehouse where we were shooting. And Anson came in with a like Bluetooth speaker over his shoulder blaring like <laughs> I don't know, Van Halen or something, just pumping everybody's music up or everybody's spirits up. And he was always one for putting on music and just kind of lightening the mood between takes. Cause you know, you can, you can feel that. Um, yeah. Just over the course of the day as the exhaustion starts to kick in, it's great to have a little shift in that. And he was, yeah, he was good for that for sure. Mm-hmm. But also the other thing was I would watch. Um, and again, I'm, I'm buried behind 15 pieces of prosthetics. So nobody really knew who was under there, but I, I would observe people between takes and how, you know, they would kind of conserve their energy. And that's went off and sit and read a book and just kind of very, very diligently and professionally, I think, just kind of hold on to what he needed because you got to come out when, when it's action time, when somebody says action, you got to go. So there's a real conservation of that, that long arc of energy. And especially if you're on, you know, it's, it's only Wednesday or whatever, and you've still got two more days to go after this. You've got to be really conscious of, of having the energy because really, you know, I can't remember what the joke is. Something along the lines of in film and TV, you get paid to wait around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the acting you do for free. Very yeah. true. It has to be such a unique experience though. Cause I mean, if you really think about it, you are filming a Star Trek show, uh, a Star Trek show during a pandemic. That's not going to happen ever again. Hopefully, hopefully in our lifetimes, it's never going to happen again. Yeah. But I mean, what a unique thing to have happen. That must be also just emotionally taxing for you just have to be, you know, not able to connect as much with your your co-stars because of the fact that there's all these precautions and, and protocols in the way. Does that, was that something that kind of like weighed on you as the process was happening? 
you know, honestly, it was it was my first experience in the world. I mean, really, I'd, I'd done a commercial and I had done a day on an indie or a couple of days on an indie film. So this was really my first experience in the world of film and TV. And so I didn't know any different. <laughs> so, you know, I was just, I was uh, filled up with gratitude to be working, first of all, during a pandemic when pretty much all of my colleagues were under lockdown conditions and theaters were all shut. I was living in, uh, and I do live in Stratford, Ontario, which is a theater town. And, you know, there were a thousand artists that were in that city that were there to work for the festival. And when it shut down, like everybody was out of work and was going home and the, the, kind of, the town kind of emptied up. And here I had this, this incredible opportunity. So I was just so happy to be working and what under whatever conditions. Um, and they were pretty, they were pretty intense, but I, honestly, I hadn't, I didn't know any different. So um, going back in now and, you know, actually getting to, you know, give somebody a hug on set would be, would be, that would be the weird thing for me. <laughs> it might've been the norm before, but now I was like, what are you doing? But, you know. Physical contact. No, thank you. Well, yeah. I know we've been sort of weaned off it, haven't we? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we we talked about Hammer uh, Hammer being this kind of like mentor character to Uhura, and uh, you mentioned the you know, Celia was one of the folks you did get to hang out with a little bit more in between takes. So uh, mm -hmm. I love to hear a little bit about building your relationship and your rapport with Celia off screen, uh, and how that would help you then on screen if you were able to actually do that kind of thing with her. Oh, it's so easy. Celia is just the like she's just an like, open ball of energy. She's just lovely. Um, yeah, it was very easy to to create that kind of. I mean, that's really that that smile of her and the glint in her eyes. I mean, that's all her. Uh, you can tell why she was cast to play that part. Um, very easy to get along with, and yeah, we, she's just. <laughs> I remember what is that? The, I think one of the first scenes where we're walking down the hallway together, and I'm sort of grilling her on on what the what the 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 unit does the, the compression unit or whatever the air filter unit um so we would go around the corner and then they would call action and while we we're standing around the corner we'd be singing and making up songs and just kind of <laughs> having a grand old time and then i found out she like she's a tony award winning yeah uh, waist singer it's like oh i'm just <laughs> i'm just improvising music with like <laughs> a pro here uh that was fun. um yeah it was, it's very easy they were all i mean yeah, I do. I do remember also sitting in the hallway and just everyone coming up and introducing themselves at a distance. Yeah, of, <laughs> of course. course, at a very uh, conscious distance. But um, yeah, it's just I think the. the I mean, I guess I, I kind of go back to this as like the the refrain of my Star Trek experience, but uh, it's got this family atmosphere to it. It really does. Um, and I met, I, I discovered that with the fans and I discovered that on the set. And, you know, one of the first questions you would get is, are you a Star Trek fan? And um, yeah, it's just, it, it, it just leaks into everything. And I think that's um, part of the reason why the franchise has been so popular and has lasted as long as it has is because it really does focus on that building of the family. And we see that in, in it seems in every iteration of Star Trek, it's like the bridge crew becomes the family or, mm -hmm or uh, you know the space station crew or whatever that they they really that leaks out of the screen and and, and kind of welcomes the viewer into the family atmosphere as well so we talked about the makeup we kind of talked about how you form the character of who hammer is but we didn't talk about the wardrobe yet because you got to put on the starfleet duds the uniform uh, and i've heard sometimes it can be comfy sometimes it's not so good <laughs> so talk to me about that uniform bruce it's great. Oh my God. I, I actually, somewhere in my archives, I have a photo of me standing in on my first day. Um, and I love going to the wardrobe trailer so much. Uh, Bernadette, uh, she's, yeah, the, the, the wardrobe designer, she's amazing. And, and that whole department, it's, it's one of my favorite rooms to, or trailers, I guess it is, to visit. Because uh, it makes the it makes the character complete, and um, nothing like getting to play dress up. And honestly, the day I got to put on the, the red shirt, although I did have to say, like, oh no, I'm in a red shirt. But I, I did. I already knew that I was going to bite it. But um, putting on the red shirt is pretty great. And I, yeah, it's pretty snug. It's pretty. <laughs> it's pretty form fitting. There's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of room for donuts in that uh, in that particular outfit. But um, 
yeah, it's just coolness. You just feel cool in it. You just like, you know, you wear the Starfleet uniform. And, and uh, yeah, I just love the little details, the, the, the engineering sort of insignia that's very, very subtly into the pattern on the on the sleeves and yeah it's it's great it's pretty great i mean my favorite honestly my favorite day was getting put on the wizard outfit because i had started about that. i got I, I started a D D campaign during the pandemic and my character was a wizard so getting nice. to put on an actual wizard outfit to go to work is pretty great <laughs> <laughs> and the elysian kingdom is also one of those fan favorite episodes now too because it was just such like started off as a very fun departure from what strange new worlds was then of course by the end of it we're all crying completely uh, you yeah. know non-stop but um you yeah. know let's, let's talk a bit about elysian kingdom though getting to wear the wizard outfit and uh you know, you know what was that set like during that that time you guys were doing that one because that's such a different type of episode yeah they dressed everything up and with the with the greenery and the foliage all over which was really cool and it was nice to go and you know you know as far enough into the series that we were revisiting the sets and they were changed and nothing oh wow they've, they've really done it up here um yeah it was such a riot i mean I mean, every episode was great, but that one was a riot because I'm a huge science fantasy nerd as well. So it was the mixture of, of, of my my favorite genre, science fiction, science fantasy. Um, and plus I'm playing a wizard in my D&D campaign. So there I am as a wizard and it's flowing robes, you know, it's it's all that that fun stuff. And and Hammer gets a, gets a pretty good chunk in that episode. I think it's probably hmm. my most screen time. Uh, of any of the episodes and working with Babs in that in particular um he's amazing to watch his process is incredible like every single take he just give a little something different a little you know a different take on the on the scene so that in editing they would have options to play with yeah he's really something and as uh as another actor he's just so giving he's just so like generous with with his performance um yeah i really enjoyed doing that show doing that episode and yeah just the fun of every all the all these characters that we'd sort of gotten to know and suddenly they've changed you know there was uh rebecca romaine as the as the huntress and yeah it was cool it was cool it's such a good <laughs> episode Nancy got to be the clown Yes, <laughs> that part was especially <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, just everybody's yeah. roles were just completely reversed. So cool. Uh, have you joined any of the uh, Disco Goes D&D sessions yet? No, no, no. We got to find a way to get you invited. Anthony Rapp, I hope you're watching this show. I doubt he does. But if you're watching the show, Anthony, you know, get uh, get Bruce in part of that. Want to play? Want to play? Yes. I got a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> got some whiz biz to do. That's right. <laughs> We talked earlier in the episode also about the way that your eyes interpret the world around you. And I'm curious mm. to know for you, like the way that you do see things, what did the sets of Star Trek look like to you? Like if you were going to paint them, how would you put that on paper? Oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, and I, not only was was the, the character visually impaired and I'm visually impaired, but I was even further visually impaired in that world because I couldn't wear contact lens. So normally... I would either be wearing a contact lens or or these very heavy bifocal glasses, which give me, even with these on, I'm only looking at about 10% vision. So mm. uh, it, during the day of shooting, I, I wasn't even wearing these. So it's it was just a total smudge, <laughs> uh, the whole thing. I, um, yeah, I, I would sort of sneak my phone around so I'd take pictures so I can go back and look at it at them later. But it was a very... Um, yeah, in a way, I, I kind of went method with it because I, I was almost fully blind for the shooting of, of the episodes. You know, it's funny, I hadn't even thought of that again until now, but it's true. I spent the, I spent all of my days from the time I went to the makeup trailer until I, I left at the end of the day almost fully blind for the, for the shoots. I think about those sets. They are embedded in my, in my uh, tactile sensation because they would give me time before for the shooting or, or between takes often uh, just to get a, like a literal feel for the rooms. Um, and for the most part, the, you know, the walls and like, I've, I've got, I think I've got like some, some background here of what engineering looked like, but I wouldn't yeah. see this stuff. I would only really have a sensation of a tactical sensation of the, the, the props and the set pieces that I could, that I actually came into contact with. So for me getting to see them, like when we saw the um, the actual episodes, like oh, that's where we were. 
that's what we were looking at. Mm -hmm. So much of those rooms was either added later in, in, in CG or it was uh, far, far enough away from me that I had no idea what I was looking at. So if it was, you know, six or eight inches away from my face, I could have a sensation or an idea of what it might look like. But anything beyond that was just this kind of smudge and blur. Uh, and I'm, I have, you know, again, I, I have to be eternally grateful to the people who worked on that show because they kept me very safe. <laughs> you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to walk off an, a, an edge or walk into a door or walk, any, you know, into a camera. That only happened once and never again. But um, yeah, they kept me very safe and very secure in where, where I was and what I was to be looking at and, you know, the direction of the eyeline, things like that. Um, yeah, but if I was to paint them, uh, you know, a lot of red, a lot of white, and a lot of gold. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting to think about it from a tactile sensation instead of a visual sensation. And, you know, I think a lot of people kind of take that for granted, too, because set design, you think it's a very visual thing, but it's also very much a tactile thing, too, because different textures will reflect light differently or will just offer different sounds, oh, yeah. different things. So, I mean, for you, as you're, like, walking around sets, do you do you have this kind of, like, maybe a, a tactile vocabulary of, like, okay, I know this is how engineering feels. This will dictate a little bit of how I perform here. Was there any of that kind of going on? Like you just knew by feel maybe like to to what to do, what oh, the room was? It was sound, actually. Sound, the, okay. All of the rooms sounded different. I mean, the huh. engineering room was all shot on an AR wall. So that was this massive studio room. And it was just buzzing the whole hmm. time because it was these screens that, were, that, that show all the background, right? And the screens shift as the camera moves, which was very disorienting. Um, but it was a huge one massive room. And so there was echo in there, or, or at least a, an audio sensation of the echo. Um, and hot, <laughs> very, very hot. Um, so yeah, definitely that. Um, but I loved uh, being in engineering and getting to touch the little panels or whatever, the little jelly beans. I mean, they just, yeah, the tactile sensation. It, it, um, it wasn't until a few days into the shoot where I started to really think about okay how is it actually possible for someone who is totally blind to read these displays mm. how would that because everything was all you know in engineering it's all the little screen displays and you're kind of looking at the stuff all very so, flat oh, I, could nasty, see, right? I, I, I could see when they would change because I would see the, the difference of the lighting or per perception or whatever and then I thought and I was at home that day making uh, making my dinner and I had the stove on and as I got close to the element of the stove and I was, I was putting a pan down on it before I even got close to it I could feel the heat radiating from it I thought oh yeah if you've got a screen and there's a pixel in the screen that's on it's going to radiate a certain amount of heat now if you had hyper awareness of you know um, like like the enar does then you would be able to sense where that heat was coming from so the pixel would be lit up in which case you'd be able to tell how it was on the screen if it was if the pixel was on then you would go okay that's that that is now on so in a way he would be able to read that in a, in a way like i was reading um, daredevil comic books at the well at, at the same time and they sort of i can't remember which edition of uh, daredevil it was but they were explaining how his radar is basically like a map that he can that part of his brain is filling in so yeah anyway it it, it really uh, it really struck me about thinking in a tactile and in a um, kind of non-visual way of the world and how someone with really heightened senses would actually be able to appear sighted so I didn't I didn't really want to think about playing Hammer as being blind it's just no he's he's seeing the world in a different way and so those antenna became in a way I would I would just yeah, cock them ever so slightly as though okay that's the information but that's that's another ear of his his visual ear if you will that's uh reading the world i think you and i should just start a daredevil podcast on the side by the way because uh that'd be such a fun <laughs> thing to do but yeah that totally makes sense though it's such a unique way to, to kind of see star trek and to be in a star trek show but, so bruce you mentioned a little bit earlier that you did actually know hammer wasn't going to make it through the fall season did you just know that from like day one or was that something you found Ooh. out you did from day one wow yeah right from well uh, probably my second or third callback for the role. Um, I, I met uh, Henry Alonso Myers, and he he talked about the the character arc, hmm. what they were planning to do, what they were hoping to do, which was to build a fan favorite and then kill him off, <laughs> as in a as an emotional springboard for Uhura to make the decision to stay with Starfleet. Hmm. Um, so knowing that, uh, and 
you know, it, it's not like I, I broadcast it um, while we were shooting the thing. Uh, and when we got to episode nine, I think it was a surprise for a few of the cast members that this was going to be happening. Oh, so you um, knew no one else did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because that episode is, is uh, All Those Who Wander, and uh, it's such an emotional send-off. Uh, like, wow, yeah. I mean, that one again... I hate how much uh, Strange New Worlds tugged on my heartstrings. Uh, I really didn't want to cry as much, but uh, thanks to all you guys for doing that to me. But uh, yeah, it, it's such a tough episode to watch just because of that, especially. So, I mean, how did you like the way that Hammer said goodbye and, and went off? Oh, I was thrilled. I was thrilled. Um, knowing that it was coming, I was a bit worried that it was going to either not land or not be... Yeah, just not be impactful. And yeah, when I read it, I got to, I, I yeah, it was it was bittersweet. It was <laughs> it was bittersweet. I was sorry that he went, but I was I was very happy that he went the way that he did. And you know, from the start of shooting that on Star Trek, I was scratching things off my bucket list. Mm-hmm. And you know, I got to be, I got to do a scene on the bridge. I got to play with the transporter. I got to. You know, I got to hold a communicator and I got to give the Vulcan salute and actually say that to Spock, live long and prosper. And uh, and also to give a little bit of advice at the end and then to sacrifice myself. I mean, that was cool. Oh, I will say one thing that did end up, sorry, just to backtrack, something that did end up on the cutting room floor was um, originally they had shot it so that Hammer would fall backwards off the uh, off the back of the ship and there was going to be a shot of him falling back yeah. <clears throat> so i got to spend a couple of days doing wire work so they hooked me up in a harness and flew me up into the ceiling and had the camera on the floor so i would fly away from it and they would reverse the shot so it looked like i was falling ah. so i got to do a day in a harness and flying up and uh unfortunately that didn't end up but i did get to do it and that meant i got a, a uh, uh, thank you t-shirt from the stunt department <laughs> so i did stunts i can i can put that on my resume um and flew like gosh like a story and a half or two stories up in, in, in the air oh, wow. on this harness rig which was really cool uh the first time i did it i, I think i probably needed to change of pants but you know <laughs> over the course of the day we went up and down a few times and i got used to it um and i can say i would probably do it again uh it was so fun um but yeah, that scene, uh, just to get back to Hammer's grand and noble sacrifice. Um, yeah, I was really happy with it. I was really happy with the way it turned out and uh, that it had any impact. Awesome. And Star Trek and Shakespeare share so many commonalities in the material in general. And I feel like the way that Hammer goes also, it felt very Shakespearean. And this felt like the perfect thing for Bruce Horak to kind of show his skills with. Uh, I mean, how yeah. did you feel about those actual final moments? Did, did it just kind of feel like a Shakespearean play for you? It was so, yeah, yeah, it, it did. It felt, it felt really honest. It felt really sincere. And yeah, it, it had the, the heightened emotional side of it, um, which was, which was great. Didn't have to, uh, didn't have to work too hard because it was all in the words on the page. And that certainly is, is my experience with Shakespeare is that the words tell the story. And if you just say the words that are written and if they're well written, which they are on Star Trek. I think that first season of Strange New Worlds is like really well crafted. Um, you just simply have to say the words and you know be truthful and honest, and away you go. Did the cast and crew do anything special for that last day on set for you? Did get a few uh, farewell gifts. Yeah, yeah. The um, there's a, a tradition in I think in film and TV where after you've done your your final shot they yeah people just gather around and there's a pretty warm send-off applause and hugs and things and it was Sally and I's uh last days together on the same day so that was a, a real emotional send-off and then um the prosthetic guys actually gave me a set of those antenna which I very proudly have at home and uh, I put them on my uh my Chewbacca doll <laughs> just across the, the streams of it <laughs> that's pretty cool they let you take that makeup home and that actually kind of leads into my next question here you know as they say in deep space nine you know we had they asked the question of what you left behind but i'm curious you know what you took with you from your time on strange new worlds and what did bruce leave behind on that set oh a lot of sweat a lot of sweat mostly off of my face <laughs> um <laughs> 
what did I take with me? Oh my God, so many memories, so many great memories, images of um, being on those sets and, and doing those scenes. And then, and also the, just sitting and imagining what it was gonna look like when it was all finished. Um, and then seeing it and just being blown away by how grand it was. You know, honestly, one of the most thrilling things was when I got the, they, they sent out like a cast trailer of the episodes before it had aired. And I got to see the opening credits of the first episode and my name shows up in the credits. I had no idea. You know, I honestly thought, I mean, there were people that, that were on that show that shot more scenes than me, more footage. I mean, Chief Kyle, I think, is in as, as many scenes as I am. So why, you know, that I'm in the opening credits, it just, it, yeah, it really choked me up quite a bit. Um, in terms of what I took from the set, it was a pair of antenna, nothing <laughs> else. <laughs> um, there, was a, there were a few kind of, um, like the, the various departments um, had uh, wrap gifts made. So the prosthetics department, for instance, had a t-shirt made, huh. which I got one of those. It's got a prosthetics crew on the side, which is pretty great. And the stunt department gave me one. And uh, oh, and then wardrobe and costumes. Yeah, they, they had a, a, a water bottle made. And said, <laughs> Look what you went and did, which is really cool. Um, and of course, the, uh, the production team gave us all like wrap jackets, which that's a prized possession for for sure. My Star Trek Strange New Worlds yeah. bomber jacket, which oh, yeah. I think I may have laminated or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the big question that fans want to know is, would Bruce Horak like to ever come back to the Star Trek yes. universe? Yeah. <laughs> or even finish oh. it. You're like, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. would, Bruce, would Bruce Horak ever? Yes, he probably would. <laughs> would you want to play another alien or would you want to be a human? Oh, I love, honestly, I just love the mask work. I love playing aliens. Um, yeah, it's that's one of my favorite things is is getting into getting into makeup like that. So yeah, give me an alien, please. <laughs> Another, I mean, sure for like for comfort and ease, I'll play the play the human. If I want an easy job, yeah, sure, I'll play I'll play a human. <laughs> I think I just distanced and mount. Whoops. Um, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I will. Um, yeah, I'd just love to to come back and play in that universe because it really is. It's like a dream come true. It's like getting to. Uh, getting to be a kid again and run around with a phaser. It's awesome. All right. So Bruce, on your many episodes of Strange New Worlds, I'd like to ask, what was your most favorite day on set? And what was the most challenging day on set for you? Oh, favorite day on set. Great question. Um, there's just so many. I really loved the day where uh, this was on Elysian Kingdom, where um sort of the big confrontation in the hallway mm. and uh, <clears throat> and uh, I flip out the communicator and send the people off to the uh, the hangar deck or whatever it was. That was really fun because got to kind of mess around a little bit. And, uh, you know, the, the magic of science prevails. That was really fun. I kind of threw a little Elvis into there, uh, which I is, is one of the secrets to my acting is to find a spot to, to do a little Elvis Presley. Um, so that was fun, and uh, <laughs> that, was, that was a super fun day on set. Um, but honestly, they were all really great. Um, and what was the other question? Uh, what was the most challenging day on set for you? Challenging, yeah, the challenging day. Well, certainly, I found shooting the death scene to be challenging. I mean, it was dragging up a lot of emotional content. But also knowing that uh, this was this was the the big demise that I'd been told about. Mm -hmm. um yeah it's a uh, you know and certainly because the way things were all broken up over the course of shooting we ended up having to go back and do some reshoots and some shots in the on the ar wall so my last day of shooting was was pretty challenging as a yeah it just felt like last day of school and there's but not in a good way I mean, usually with last day of school it's like hey we're going into summer it's, but it was like wow like this is it. This is this is what I'd been spent all that time working on, and uh, the final scene that we shot was actually landing on the planet in episode nine, and kind of walking across and saying, "Oh, it's just like Andoria." Um, yeah, and just that that final wrap. I mean, it was really uh, it was really sweet having the send off, but it was also that that kind of emotional. Oh, okay, there we are. Away we go. And who knows what happens next? <laughs>
And I am happy, by the way, you mentioned that scene with uh, science, power of science prevailing. I love that scene so much. Uh, just, <laughs> let me banish you all to the shadow realm now. Uh, That's right. So I got some non-Trek stuff for you too, Bruce. Uh, I'd love to know what's the best piece of advice or life lesson that anybody ever gave to you that you still think about and use today? Oh, there's so many. I've had, I've been really blessed with a lot of really wonderful mentors in my life. Um, and yeah, they're, they've given me a lot of great advice. James Gordon Ayer, who was a painter, a Canadian painter. Hmm. I met him when he was about 80 years old and we got talking about painting and just living the creative life. And he said that one thing he would often tell his students was that if they ever got stuck painting, that they should just keep painting. And it's a phrase that I, I, I think about all the time as I'm kind of dealing with either a painting project or a writing project or acting or whatever and you kind of get stuck and it's like the impulse often is to, to kind of put it down and walk away and maybe give up on something but that that phrase of you get stuck painting keep painting kind of comes back in and so I apply that to to a lot of things in my life because oftentimes it's in the struggle that the greatest learning happens. Yeah, a big theme of my questions for this episode has been about the way that you see the world and the way that you interpret the world around you and you know, speaking as an actor who is visually impaired, uh, is there something that you wish uh, visually able folks knew and understood about visually impaired people that you wanted to get out there? <laughs> I, I guess I, I often surprise myself in what I'm able to do. And, um, and, you know, for instance, like figuring out a way to juggle was something that I thought, wow, there's just absolutely no way to do this. I don't have death perception. And I kind of practiced and practiced and practiced. And one of my brothers made the really astute observation that juggling isn't about learning to catch. It's about learning to throw. And if you throw it the same way every time, then it's always going to land in the same spot. And the catch will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And that was a big turning point in how I figured out how to learn to juggle. And so I was as surprised by my ability to juggle as fully sighted people are in when they see me juggle three things and yet and in that sort of shared excitement and shared like disbelief i think there's a an opportunity for connection so allowing for the opportunity to to try something to fail at it maybe to get better at it and to succeed at it um is an opportunity for people of all abilities to connect um I will be as surprised by my success as somebody else, <laughs> but also uh, to celebrate in that success together, I think is an opportunity to, to share in all of our abilities. So Bruce, most important thing today, what's the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? What's the best thing? I think it's the legacy. I think that it's, it's going to be around and that it's going to be around for a long time. And that Hammer was so, loved and um i went to my very first star trek convention in las vegas last summer and uh jonathan frakes who i mean i just <laughs> i completely fanboyed as i met him but he he observed it he said look like this this community is all about love and who wouldn't want that and it went to that convention and just a lineup of people coming up to express how how deeply fond they were of Hammer, how much they loved Hammer and how sorry they were to see him go. And it was like getting to attend my own funeral. It was really lovely um, that it's had such a wonderful impact on people and that uh, that there was so much love for it. I mean, that's just the best. I mean, I'm still angry that Hammer is gone, but I'm happy that you've enjoyed the experience. And uh, I definitely look forward to seeing more Bruce in Star Trek shows for the future. Uh, but you brought up the cons. I mean, how did you like your first ever Star Trek con in Vegas? That, that's got to be a weird thing. It was so great. It was so great. It was, yeah, it was wonderful. I was just on cloud nine for the entire weekend. Um, everyone I met was just so lovely and, and yeah, and got to sit on a panel. I mean, it was a real whirlwind for sure. I, mm. I wish that I could have, uh, uh, just frozen a few of those moments, you know, just to hold on to them forever. But, um, yeah, I can't wait to do more. I really can't. I do know you've got a few coming up. So uh, let, let's talk about what else uh, Bruce Hardick has coming up very soon. Because you've got a show that you're in. Uh, you're also yes. going to do some more con appearances. So tell us what's going on in the world of Bruce Horak. 
Well, I'm currently in Calgary, Alberta, my old hometown. I'm rehearsing Richard III for the Shakespeare Company, which opens April 14th. So I'm, yeah, I'm working on that eight hours a day, six days a week, um, rehearsing a little Richard III Shakespeare. And uh, that takes me to the beginning of May. And then I can't remember the exact dates. You'll have to remind me, Matthew, uh, TrekCon or uh, Long Island. Yeah, that's right. You're going to be at uh, Trek Long Island, May 20th and 21st in Hop Hog, Long Island, which is not that far from the city. Uh, that's yeah, right. that's I cannot wait to finally meet you in person because I'm going to be there. I'm going to be uh, doing a panel there as well. Oh, uh, great. So I'll be doing a whole bunch of things. I'm, I'm super excited, though, to get to meet you in person. So I cannot wait to have yeah. that face to face time with you. Yeah, yeah. So I'll be there in, in, at Trek Long Island. And then uh, end of July, I'll be at uh, Vulcan in Vulcan, Alberta. Nice. Which is not far from Calgary. And they're having their, I guess this is like their 30th anniversary of uh, Star Trek convention in wow. Vulcan, uh, which will be, yeah, it'll be lovely because, um, you know, got, got the hometown advantage. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then when is it? August, I'm performing in, uh, in Vancouver at uh, Bard on the Beach doing a production of Goblin Macbeth which is uh, a show that my creative partner, Rebecca Northen and I have created where three goblins discover the complete works of William Shakespeare and decide to do their version of Macbeth. And we are in these goblin masks that were made by Composite Effects, which is a, these are movie grade, movie quality goblin masks. And so it's combining a couple of my favorite worlds, again, fantasy uh, and Shakespeare. So uh, it's a gory, bloody mess of uh, three goblins doing Macbeth. And that happens in uh, August, September. And then uh, it's out in, at the Stratford Festival in uh, September, October. Goblins. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you throw in a little Elvis as well as your Goblins and your Shakespeare all on the same show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there's there's always room for Elvis. There's always room. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to top that sentence. But uh, <laughs> Bruce, thank you so much for chatting today and uh, telling us all about your life, your experiences in Star Trek. Uh, and yeah, it, it's been so awesome chatting with you because really you do have such a unique part in the world of Star Trek. What you did is so different and how you did it especially uh, is truly mm. amazing. So I loved hearing about your experiences and how you interpret the world. Uh, honestly, I would love to see you do a self-portrait as Hammer because I'd love to see what you see in him and what you see in that character. All right, I'll get on it. <laughs> you got some homework to do, Bruce. So uh, thank you so much. Appreciate all of your Thanks, time. Matthew. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Until next time, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trek Untold, all one word. If you'd like to directly support this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter over on patreon.com slash trekuntold, which gives you access to some great perks that can't be beat. Or pick up some merchandise from our store, or use my Amazon shop link to check out all kinds of different Star Trek merchandise. Links for all these things are in the show notes. Shout out to Triple Fiction Productions for being a key sponsor of Trek Untold. Don't forget to check them out and all of the fine folks whose ads you've seen or heard on this podcast too. If you have any questions, feedback, or comments for the show, or would like to suggest a guest or discuss sponsorship options for any of these episodes in the future, send me a message at trekuntold at gmail.com. I hope to see you here again as we uncover more untold stories from Star Trek and beyond and get to know even more amazing people who have contributed to this ever-expanding universe. Until next time, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms, is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network, and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.